Hi, this is Eddie Muller, welcoming you back to TCM's series of Neo Noir. I am joined by Ben Mankiewicz, my co host for this series here on the Noir Alley set. How are you doing, Ben? I'm well, Eddie. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here. This, is, uh, this has been fun. It has been fun. And tonight, forget Neo Noir. Yeah. We're going for future noir. We're starting <laughs> off with future noir. And people said, uh, you know, you're going to program this. Uh, are you going to show movies from the 60s, 70s, 80s? And I said, I'm showing a movie from 2019, <laughs> <laughs> which is the year in which Blade Runner is set. Right. It was Philip K. Dick who wrote this story in 1966, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, about society manufacturing replicant of humans in order to do all the jobs that humans don't want to do, right? right? So there is a timeliness to this movie there still is. today. Uh, but the conceit of the film is the whole thing is told in the form of a detective story uh, with Deckard, who's a blade runner, usually ex-cops, I guess, who are hired to hunt down the replicants that go rogue. Yeah. So that is the basic premise of this movie. This movie basically takes every cliche and trope of detective fiction and film noir and says, what would it look like yeah. that many years into the future? And that's why it's not so much using it pejoratively of cliche and trope, because they are reimagining these things in the 21st century, which to them was, you know, 40 years later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sid Mead's production visualization for this film is absolutely extraordinary. You know, all science fiction movies depicted the future as clean. And in this movie, Sid Mead said, you know, they're just going to build the future on top of the present. That's how it's going to work. You know, there's no way around it. So that's why this movie visually is so amazing. And why I think a lot of people consider this to be a classic is because it is a classic of production design. As is so often the case with these movies, uh, it's the star that got the movie made, right? Because at the time uh, this film was made, it's 1981, Eight, 1981. Uh, Harrison Ford was the, maybe the biggest star in Hollywood at this moment, right? Uh, he had done Star Wars, he had done Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's like, how can we go wrong? So when Ridley Scott came aboard to direct this, you know, who has an incredible visual sense. Yeah, one of the best. Uh, one of the best, and I think it really appealed to him to depict this world. And the critics were not kind to this movie when it came out. You know, it was like a big so what, which is kind of startling. Yeah, science fiction fans have uh, certainly uh, helped preserve its legacy. And it gets back to the thing I was talking about earlier, that idea. That idea is so good, Philip K. Dick's idea. And then Ridley, Ridley Scott imagining that and putting it on screen. You know, this is two years after he, he makes Aliens, so he becomes this guy. This guy knows how to do a science fiction movie uh, that matters. And the, the only, my only, uh, it's not really a complaint, but what I want more every time I see this is more of who I think is the most interesting character in the movie, and I think you do too, more of the idea of consciousness and what it means, well, right? And we don't, and that's the villain. Roy, that's Roy, Roy yeah. Batty, played right. by Rutger, Rutger Hauer, Hauer. Yeah. who is the villain of the piece. Yeah. But to me, he's also the most interesting character in the film. And also, for fans of old noir, they make brilliant use of the Bradbury building in downtown do. in L.A., yeah. uh, which is kind of startling because it's derelict in the movie, but it's still there. Yeah. It still is in good condition. Right. They have preserved it, but, man, they trash it in this movie. And uh, you'll, you'll know when you get to the Bradbury building because you've seen it in a bunch of noir films from, you know, DOA and a... Uh, Joseph Losey's M, it's all the wrought iron and the filigree. There's no building like it anywhere else. And it has the uh, atrium skylight, uh, which is used to great effect in this film. And uh, we like to say what we'd be remiss of. We'd be remiss, as always, if we didn't mention uh, M. Emmett Walsh. M. Emmett Walsh, again, yeah. popping yeah. up in a film. Yeah, yeah Blood Simple is in our uh, lineup this month, and he's in that, and here he is. Uh, very different characters here. This is not a... T First of all, you don't think of M. Emmett Walsh in a... Uh, in, a in a science fiction movie, science fiction movie, science fiction yeah. movie but, uh, yeah. but he's good in any movie. So, uh, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> prepare yourself. This is quite an extraordinary trip into the brave new world of 2019 
Here is Harrison Ford starring in Blade Runner. So it's hard for me to even imagine how this date began in a pre-internet world, in a pre-social media world, a pre-blog, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook world. But was Deckard, is Deckard a replicant, right, is the, is the issue that, this, that the sci-fi fans like to talk about. Uh, Ridley Scott says yes. I mean, that's, she's really on the record as yes. Uh, Ford played him as human and thinks he is human, and I love that they have competing opinions about yes. it. Yes. Which yeah. puts well, they, it back. They argued about everything yeah, on that's this right. movie. They did. Yeah. They did, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, this is the thing, Ben. When you, when you write speculative fiction, yeah. people get to speculate. Yeah. That's, right. <laughs> that's, that's the purpose of it, right? So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are people watching right now when you say, so Deckard is a replicant. Right? They're like, what? Yeah. What movie are you talking about? No, by the way, the first time that got mentioned to me, I'm not a science fiction, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fanboy, and I don't say that pejoratively. No, I think I did say it pejoratively. <laughs> you did, um, you did. did. It's okay, I, I heard be, it. Let's be honest, right? I heard it. I, um, I, I can't wait to see the emails. Uh, but I do love that idea, right? You know, and he wouldn't be a Series 6 or something, so he'd have a, a longer lifespan. Um, so anyway, it's a, certainly a, it's a cool idea. I, I believe it's the purpose of this story yeah. to put that idea into your head yeah. to make you question the idea of existence. I mean, that's, that's what's interesting about this movie, Ben, to me, is, as you pointed out in the intro, I love the premise of this film. This is, because people talk about uh, film noir, like what are the themes of film noir? And one of the common themes is identity, right? Who am I? Right. What, what am I capable of? Do I really know who I am? This takes it to the next level. It's beyond identity, and it's a movie about existence. Like, who made me? Right. Like, why am I here? What is my purpose? You know? And it's amazing that they try to deal with that subject in, like, this ersatz detective story that, you know, which, quite honestly, doesn't age well. In, in my estimation, I, yeah. what I thought was really cool in 1981, like, hey, look, they're doing, like, the Maltese Falcon and the Big Sleep as a science fiction movie. I find that all of that stuff that they're imitating, it doesn't really work that well any longer. Yeah, I, I, when I saw it again, I thought it was slow. And, and its bleakness, the way, uh, like, Get Carter... Mike Hodges' 1971 film with Michael Caine, the way uh, that's bleak, uh, Friends Eddie Coyle is bleak, but that adds to it. Here, I wanted someone to, I mean, is, is this future Los Angeles? First of all, it's unrealistic because it's always raining, right? <laughs> it's it's always raining. Right. And, yeah. Well, there must be something about global warming. It right. must be some kind of... But I didn't, uh, so I, 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 I felt a little punished by the bleakness. Uh, uh, for, certainly, just from a viewing point of view, uh, frustrated me a little bit. No, that's a really interesting observation to me because I remember seeing this film and being so overpowered by the visuals yeah. that your brain works really hard just to comprehend what you're watching. There's a lot. There's a, there's a lot happening. There is a lot going on. Like, what does that thing do? What right. is that? Why does this guy have the hoses coming out of his back? I mean, it, there's just so much stuff in the movie that it's hard to concentrate on the story. And then later on, you watch it and you realize there isn't really much of a story there to concentrate on. Right. And it's interesting because the movie, to me, is a little bit soulless until the last scene. Right. And and Rutger Hauer gives this movie its soul when he has his death scene yeah. on top of the building. And it's it's spectacular. It's one of the great death scenes in movie history as it's, far as I'm concerned. I agree. Uh, but yeah. So let's yeah, let's go back and tell these guys how to remake their movie. I think they I think they're dying to hear from us. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> this is a thing that happens with movies that are hugely influential is that they inspire so many other movies that 20 years yeah. later when you go back and watch them, you say, "Uh, 
because you've seen it all imitated. That's right. It's, it's in totally, other films, it's right? totally, totally unfair. I mean, I'm, it is. Yeah. And uh, uh, do you watch any of Westworld? Which, by the way, you can get yes. on uh, HBO Max. So, I mean, that's the first of all. The movie was great. The '74 uh, film was great. But you know, Westworld does a great job of exploring the consciousness exactly, uh, of the yeah. robots. And I get, you know, I get it that Westworld comes from Westworld, but it feels to me massively influenced by Blade Runner. Yeah, I, I agree. But, Ben, we are going to leave Los Angeles in 2019 behind because we have a date in London in 1986 uh, with really one of my personal favorites in this series. Yeah. So stick around because we are bringing you Bob Hoskins and Kathy Tyson in Mona Lisa coming up next.